I'm, I'm ready. Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 Right. 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 So I was having this conversation with my son. We went to church together last week. First time we've been to church together in years. And I went where he wanted to go. And we had a good time there. I mean, Josh knows he's also seen a lot of ugly here in the early days. And it kind of turned him off. And so I get it. I do. But that's not an excuse. Right. Okay. So anyway, we went to this church and I think I told you about it at the beginning of service. But it was actually the message was very good. And so we talked about it. It it would go a church like that would go well here. Um, But the problem is, is that you don't find a church like that very often where you have a mega church that has all the mega church accoutrements and then a biblical message. You generally don't have that. Am I right? Generally don't have that. And so we were talking about this and his culture. And so, I mean, it boils down to, Dad, I don't want to hear about it. He's, he's in his 30s. He lives his life. He has his friends. Uh, he, he, he doesn't want to hear about it. So he's not going to come to church here and hear about it. You understand? So this is what this is what happens. So people of that generation and younger who do go to church, they're generally not going to seek out a church like ours because all of their friends, they drink, they're living together, they're um, they some of them do recreational drugs or they have homosexual friends, right? And they're not going to be here so that they're not alienated over here. But if they go to big mega box church or they go to church where nothing is preached against, then it doesn't offend or alienate them from their friends and their peers. The devil is the prince and the power of this world. And so when the church gets worldly, who's the prince and power of the worldly church? The devil is. And so this is why you go down through Waynesboro at this hour. Of course, this is normally the hour you have the the preaching. We're backwards, right? But if you go down through Waynesboro at this hour, you're going to find a lot of churches are still open. But there's only a handful of cars in the parking lot. You're going to find that during the preaching hour, they're mostly older people. The church is dying. And your mainline denominations in Waynesboro are closing down left and right. Your Methodist churches, your Presbyterian churches, your Brethren churches, they're closing down or they're in a decline. Our church is probably one of the few in Waynesboro that is a mainline denomination that is maintaining or growing. And so we can only grow so much because we don't have any room. Right? When there's no parking, people aren't going to come. When there's no parking, it's just that's the way it is. But nevertheless, um, and I ain't one of these people to go, let's go build a big church. No, no. Let some other church get to people that can't get in, right? But anyway, that's neither here nor there. But we were talking about it. I was trying to explain it to him. You know, what's going on in his culture and his generation. But it was, I could tell it was like, you're making me uncomfortable. Stop. Time to stop. Right. Right. And see, that stems from postmodernism. How many of y'all have heard the term postmodernism? All right. So we're past postmodernism. Postmodernism is this: is that my truth is is just as good as your truth. Uh, my truth is I'm not hurting you. You're not hurting me. You can believe what you want. Just don't tell me I've got to believe what you believe. And I can believe what I believe. I won't, I won't enforce that on you unless it comes down to I think you're a homophobe or you're right. right. And so that's where that, those lines are. Everybody understands that, right? But we're post that now. We're beyond postmodern. We're post-Christian. We are living in a post-Christian society. We're living in paganism. 
We're in the middle of the greatest revival that has ever been in the United States of America. It is a spiritual revival, but it is not a Christian spiritual revival. It is a pagan spiritual revival. And paganism is on the increase. Uh, witchcraft, uh, hedonism, image and worship, self-worship, money worship, all of that is hedonism. Um, and hedonism is displayed outwardly. Hedonism is displayed through alcohol, drugs, and sexual activity. It was that way in the Bible. It's that way now. Because we're living in biblical times. All times are biblical times. And so we're living it out. And so as we see our young people right now on college campuses, I would not send my child to a secular university for anything. I wouldn't send them to Liberty University for anything. That's just as bad. Actually, it's worse because they had it. I would rather they go to a trade school and learn how to do something instead of go to college and learn how to drink and have sexual immorality and hide it from mom and dad. Get brainwashed. Yes. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on, but. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Would you pray for us, Denny, and then we'll jump right into our Sunday school lesson. Christine's daughter. Also. Christine's daughter. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Amen. All right. So remember, we already had uh, the sin with, with Abraham and um, he with Hagar and all that, right? And so we were talking about Ishmael and, and Isaac, right? Okay, so this is where we are. This is where we're picking it up. This is Abraham and Abimelech. And so uh, this is what happened. We just had the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, remember? And then Lot and his daughters, the incestuous relationship that took place. And now we're, we're picking the story up with Abraham once again. In chapter number 20, there's only 18 verses, but they are important verses in the lineage of Abraham. They're important verses in the lineage of Ishmael, and they are important verses that lead us up to Isaac. And so this chapter is an unusual chapter in the fact that it is, it is almost outside the storyline. So if you're reading and you're reading up through Abraham's life, and we, we start in 15, read all the way through 19, and we're reading all the story, the, the, the Abrahamic covenant that's promised, and then how he fails, and, and he says that Sarah's his sister, not his wife. You know that, right? And he's going to do that again. And so we, we read this account, then they got uh, Hagar out of Egypt, and uh, then... Ishmael comes along and now there's resentment between Hagar and, uh, and, Abram and Sarah and all this stuff. It's like, it's like a continual story. Then there's an, oh, by the way, Lot is along for the journey. And Lot, because he chose the worldly things instead of the godly things, this is what happened to him. Even though he was a, a righteous man, according to the New Testament, he went into some deep, serious sin. And it is a warning to us. Just because you know the Lord does not mean that you can't get off on some serious stuff. And it will affect you and it will affect others down the line. Just like his descendants were the descendants that caused constant problems to the nation of Israel. Right? We talked about that. Everybody with me? And so now this chapter is kind of like a little bit out of the ordinary line. And there's a reason why. Maybe you'll pick it up. If not, we'll talk about it a little later. And Abraham journeyed from thence <clears throat> toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. Now I'm going to take this verse by verse because there's some important stuff as we go verse by verse. Now, the word Gerar means to drag off roughly. And so this is what happens. He's heading south. He's heading down. 
it's important for you to understand this. When you read the Bible, the directions that people go, it'll tell you they're going up or they're going down, they're going north or they're going south. And you're going to find as the directions that people go, not always, but in many instances, when they're going down, they're going down. Not just in a physical manner, but in a spiritual manner. This is what's taking place with Abraham at this point. So he's heading down to Gerar. Um, the context of Gerar means to drag off roughly. It was a rough, uh, uh, an absolutely rough and violent place. And he sojourned in Gerar. Uh, that has the idea of him staying a longer time. He didn't just pass through. He decided he's going to stay there for a while. Now, there are many reasons for this. Uh, for him going that I've, I've read. I don't know what the exact reason is. The most prominent thought of the, of the old Jewish scholars was that he saw the destruction of, of Sodom and Gomorrah. He knew what had happened to his, ne uh, his nephew Lot and he knew all that was going on and he was trying to distance himself from that. Remember, Abraham had done nothing wrong. Abraham was in a place where God was blessing him. But because he saw what happened, and very possibly, according to many uh, of the Jewish scholars, is that the people of the region saw the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the, the region thereabout and would blame Lot and would blame Abraham. So Abraham fled out of protection. It's plausible, isn't it? Doesn't give us an exact reason, but it's very plausible. Verse number two. Now he's going to have a, a lapse and he's going to go back into an old sin. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, he's down in Ger Gerar. He says of, of, of his wife, Sarah, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. So there's a couple things to understand here. He's gone to a place where it's obvious God did not lead him. Everybody in agreement with that? We don't see God telling him to go. We see him choosing to go. And we see this, this urgent matter of self-preservation once again. Isn't that what happened to him the last time? So it was self-preservation instead of trusting God to preserve him. God had already promised that through Sarah was going to come the lineage, the seed, uh, seed blessing. Instead of just trusting God where you are in the midst of a difficult circumstance, he fled it. And he's trying desperately for this uh, self-preservation instead of trusting God. Now, let's not get too harsh on O Abraham. That would be our first reaction too. Our first response would be to self-preserve. Am I right or wrong? I mean, if somebody was said, I'm going to come burn your house down, and there's like a hundred thousand of them going to come burn your house down, you'd probably leave your house. It's common sense, isn't it? Instead of going, well, God gave me this home and God will bless me right here. You might fry and sizzle like a piece of Jimmy Dean sausage too. You're going to self-preserve. You're going to leave. Yeah, human factor in this thing. But Abraham had been promised in a special way, a promise that we don't have is that nothing was going to happen to him and nothing was going to happen to Sarah because through Sarah was coming the lineage, which would be Jesus, the seed blessing. You and I don't have such a promise, do we? Our promise is this, that when we die, we get to go to be with him. And we're accounted as sheep to the slaughter all the day long. What a promise. Meaning you could die at any moment, okay? Let's keep going. So Abimelech is the king of Gerar. Now, Abimelech, as we know from history, the only things that we can know from history by the, just the meaning of his name and so forth is that he's a very violent man. And he's a very, uh, probably a large man, not necessarily a giant, but a large man, an angry man. He is a, a king of Gerar, a king of a rough place. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night. Now, this is important. So God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. Stop right there. So God is working through a dream. Now, we talk about this all the time, and, and I'm just going to throw this out there. Yes, God can still work through a dream. Yes, God can warn you. Yes, God can wake you up. Yes, He can. 
It's not the norm because we don't need that anymore. We have the full Bible, right? But God can do anything that God wants to do to get your attention if God wants to get your attention. Let's, let's not put God in that box. And I hope you agree with that today uh, because God can, can show you a lot of things, uh, even simple things, right? Okay, everybody with me? And so all of a sudden this man, he took Sarah. So Abraham is in Gerar, and he says, this isn't my wife, this is my sister. Now he's not lying, it's his half-sister. They have the same father, different mothers. And this is half-sister. But he said, this is my sister, not my wife. And so the king took her. Now notice this dream, and notice something very important. And this is the importance of marriage, people. Notice what God did. There's strong language here. You're a dead man, because that's another man's wife. Oh, if God would still give that dream today. Now, he's not going to do that for everybody because not everybody's Sarah. And Sarah was the promised one. She was the blessed one. She was the one who was going to give birth to the child, Isaac, the laughter. She was going to give birth and through him was going to come the Lord Jesus. And God was not going to have Abimelech mess this up. Now, who is behind all this? The devil's behind all this. The devil is getting Abraham afraid. And God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. And old Abraham's scared to death. He's afraid. He's gone into self-preservation mode. And so now he's worried about his own skin, his own hide. And he's afraid they'll kill him and, and just to get Sarah, which they probably would in that culture. And also remember this, Sarah is in her 90s. That boggles my mind. She was, a, she was a specimen, if you will, all right? She was a looker. And so she obviously didn't look her age, right? And so anyway, this is crazy, is it not? All right, so let's keep going. So this language is very important because notice what he says. You're a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken. She is a man's wife. You see, the marriage is important. God brings the marriage. God established the marriage. And God has some pretty stiff penalties for adultery. And I think we forget that in our generation, in our culture. Do we not? And it is, it's still serious. But Abimelech had not come near her. He hadn't touched her. He was just thinking about it. He just took her. He hadn't got there yet. Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord will, thou, Lord, will thou slay a righteous nation. Now, this is anything but a righteous nation. Look at verse 5, and then I'll back up to something. Said he not unto me, she is my sister, and she even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. Now, reading that, you would think Abimelech's a Sunday school teacher, wouldn't you? Abimelech is no Sunday school teacher. Abimelech's plea for mercy is founded. It's just. But remember who Abimelech was. He's the king of Gerar. And these people were rough. They worshipped Dagon. They worshipped Ashtaroth. And they worshipped Beelzebub. Y'all know Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies? Who is that? That is Satan himself. And they worshipped Satan. They were Satan worshippers. And they did all kinds of immorality and debauchery. They, they were people who killed innocent people. They killed babies. They killed sacrificed women to gods. They did all this stuff. And they did it in the name of Satan. And so here's this Satan worshiper calling out to God and telling God he's a righteous man and an innocent man. The only righteous thing that he was was righteous in his plea to God for mercy. Because he was lied to. Isn't it interesting that God listened to this sinner's prayer? This lost man's prayer. But remember this, God initiated the conversation. I want you to understand something. We ought to teach people to pray everywhere. Lost people, saved people, everybody ought to be praying. You ought to be talking to the Lord. Lost people, when they pray, no, God doesn't hear them the same way he hears us. But God knows everything and God hears everything. So I know you've heard it. I probably said, God doesn't hear the prayers of a lost man. That's not true. God hears the prayers of every man. 
But the difference is, now that I'm saved, I'm His child. When I was not saved, I was a stranger asking another person's father for stuff, right? Different relationship. But when I was a lost man, I also cried out to God for mercy and God had mercy on me and saved me. How about you? Yeah, so God does hear the prayers of a lost man. Please remember that. We ought to teach men everywhere to pray. And so here's Abimelech and he comes to God and in his prayer, he is making a plea to God that he is innocent uh, of this thing. And he said, look at notice this in verse number five or four. Will thou slay also a righteous nation? Also. Guess what he also knew about? Sodom and Gomorrah. Will you also slay a righteous nation, our nation? They weren't homosexuals. They were Satan worshipers. They were straight, but they worshiped the devil. So in his eyes, he was good to go. Isn't that just like the world today? I'm not as bad as they are. Get it? So he didn't want his nation destroyed like God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. By the way, the Lord made sure that the world knew that he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And this uh, Satan-worshipping king who didn't worship the Lord acknowledged that the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. That's important for you to understand. This world out there, even when they are, even when they say they're Satanists, they say they are, um, they don't believe in God, they're atheists. You know, somebody that doesn't believe in something sure does use the Lord's name in vain a lot. And they sure do get mad at you when you say something about something they don't believe in, right? That's nonsense. And so there's so much crazy stuff here. But at the same time, they're always judging themselves based on other people. And at this time, he said, I'm innocent. You're not. You worship God. Notice this, and please don't ever miss, miss this. God uses the lost world to correct us. And when God uses the lost world to correct us, there is no correcting like that. I know something about that myself. And I've told you all this before. I started preaching and I was preaching revivals. I was on the radio. I was on FBN and BBN and, and, and I, all that. People, people used to want to listen to what I had to say back then. And I got my bloomers in a bunch and I got away from God and I ended up in Chisholm's Lounge in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Budweiser in one hand, a cigarette in the other hand. I didn't even smoke. But I was running from God. And I, I, they, they had poles in there like we have in the assembly room and I was hiding behind them things. I saw this woman come in just a few weeks or months. I don't remember the timeline now, but I had sat in her living room. She was an alcoholic. And I had told her that if she would trust Jesus, God could deliver her from that alcohol. God would save her and set her free. I wasn't lying. But now here I am, backslid on God with a Budweiser in my hand in a bar. Out of all the people in that dark place, her eyeballs locked on mine. And she made a beeline right straight for me. And she said... I tell you one thing, Butch Labervat. Don't you ever tell me anything about your God again. Because I don't believe a word you have to say. That was God using that lost woman to adjust this old boy. I left that place. I went home. I walked my driveway all night, weeping and crying. Begging God to have mercy on me. I was like Abraham and Gerar. I was where I didn't belong. I was trying to be somebody I wasn't, living a lie, miserable, and God used the world to call me out. Has anything like that ever happened to any of y'all? It's good, ain't it? When that adjusts you, there ain't no going back because you know how serious your sin is. I wish it would happen to every Christian. I really do. Because...
And we've been trying to make you mad enough to cuss ever since, haven't we, Pastor? <laughs> yeah, oh, I tell you. And it's bad, isn't it? Because you just go, oh, I missed, I failed. Yeah. But you know what? There's forgiveness in the Lord. There's mercy and grace in God. And you, there's a second reason I'm thankful that happened to me, because I don't, while I preach against all those things, if that is you, I don't look down my nose at you. I love you. And I will never, ever forsake you. You can walk away from God. You can find yourself in the cesspool of this world. And at any moment, you can call me and I will come help you no matter where you are. Because I love you. And I've been there. And I'd much rather that I show up and help you than you call some self-righteous biddy who wants to come and tell you, I told you so. Amen. Yeah. Yep. Let's keep going. How did I get off on that? Here we go. So notice this. I haven't come near her. I haven't touched her. Will you destroy the righteous nation? So he knew about Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said, Sarah lied to me too. They're in this together. They're in cahoots. This was twice the trouble, wasn't it? And this is a serious lie, y'all. It's a serious lie. Look at verse number six. So, and God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against thee. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. It was God that took that desire, that natural uh, human male desire for the, uh, the sexual union with a woman. God took that out of him, took it away from him, so he wouldn't touch her. God did that. Because what was supposed to happen was between Abraham and Sarah. And remember when the angel said next year this time, listen to me, next year this time you will be with, you will have a child. So God made it so that God didn't lie to Abraham. Remember that. God's promises are yea and nay. They're not, well, maybe. They're absolute. Yes? All right. So God said to him in a dream, uh, I withheld this from thee, so you didn't touch her. Verse number seven. Now therefore restore the man and his wife. Take her back to him. For he is a prophet. Notice that. This man, Abraham, was a prophet. What was Abraham prophesying? We don't see him as a prophet like Isaiah. We don't see him as a prophet like Jeremiah or Joel or... Obadiah even, or any of those, do we? But what was it about Abraham that made him a prophet? God had told him that through him would come the Messiah. And so when Abraham, everywhere Abraham went, that was his message. He was foretelling this. He was a tall man. He was a father of height as Abram, but he's going to be a father of a multitude as Abraham. And that's what he was prophesying. And he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. So he's going to make Abraham, who lied to him, pray for him. Now you talk about using a man, and you talk about conviction, chastening, and rebuke. Imagine if that was you. You just cussed somebody out, you lost your temper, you blew your testimony, and now then God tells you you need to pray for them. Hmm. What if, think about this. Y'all with me? You're driving home today, mind your own business. Somebody cut you off. You lose your temper. You flip them off, cuss them out, chase them down the street, beeping their horn, tell them they're number one, all kinds of stuff, right? They pull over and get out and go, I'm sorry, I, I was on my way home from church. You know, I didn't mean to do that. Jesus loves you. God can save you from your anger. And then you go, oh, well, listen, I'm a Christian too. Let me pray for you. Do you get that? Put yourself in a real situation. This is Abraham. Uh, let me pray for you. If thou restore her not, know thou, thou that thou surely shalt die and all that are thine. So if you don't take her back, choice is yours, Abimelech. If you don't take her back, I'm going to kill you and everybody in your, in your family. You won't have a king. You won't be the king and none of your heirs will be the king. 
That's important to somebody like Abimelech. So he's going to be obedient. Therefore, Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their ears, and the men were sore afraid. They had a fear of the Lord, not Abimelech. There was a fear of the Lord. These Satan worshipers had a fear of the Lord. By the way, there's coming a day when every Satan worshiper will have the fear of the Lord. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us, and what have I offended thee, uh, that thou hast brought on me and on thy kingdom a great sin? Notice that word. Do you understand that to a Satanist there is no such thing as sin? Let me help you out here. That word sin is foreign to Abimelech. The word sin is foreign to that language, to that ancient language. But he used that term. Why? Because he had sinned against the Lord. He knew it because God had just taught it to him. Yeah. But notice this. Why, why did you bring on me and on my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. Even devil worshipers know you ain't supposed to do this. You ought not do that. That's bizarre, isn't it? And Abimelech said to Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place. There you go thinking again, Abraham. Let me stop right there for a minute. How many of you, let's be honest, because I do this, you judge people and you talk to them and you deal with them based upon the way they look, the way they dress, sometimes their mannerisms. And lo and behold, when you get to know them, they're either much worse than you thought they were or much better than you thought they were. And you were fooled. Look, don't judge a book by its cover. And don't do that because you don't know the heart. Only God knows the heart, right? But notice this, Abraham said, because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place. It's obvious, you're Satan worship. You worship Dagon, Ashtoreth, which is uh, a, the sexual male image, and Beelzebub, Satan himself. You worship the devil and sex, and I just assumed there's no fear of God in this place. And there wasn't until God delivered unto Abimelech his fear. God made sure that what was necessary necessarily happened. Running from God, more than likely, because he was trying to self-preserve. He was afraid of losing his life. And from most of the ancient scholars, that's where, where, I'm start, where I started from, most of the ancient Jewish uh, rabbis always taught that Abraham was running south because all, all those people in the land was destroyed and they blamed Lot, which by relationship blamed Abraham and they would have desired to kill him. Yeah. But he was in no danger. Only he didn't see that because he's human just like us. So he's running south. And by the way, what, what is south? Down. Down, he's going away from God. And they will slay me for my wife's sake. So I, I didn't see any godliness in this place and figured they would kill me and take my wife. And yet indeed she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. You have to remember that wasn't taboo then. It becomes that later under the law but not then because there's only so many people on planet Earth. You get that, right? So he married his half-sister. And so she became his wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wonder from my father's house that I said to her, this is thy kindness which thou shalt show unto me at every place whither we shall come. Say of me, he's my brother. And so notice this, when it come to pass, when God caused me to wonder. Now here, God didn't cause him to wonder. Let's stop and get this right. So remember before, God told him to go to a certain place. And as he went, that was the lie he came up with. 
There is no mention, there's no indication that God told him to go down. This is self-preservation. He's going the wrong direction. He's going into the place where he is in more danger than he would have been had he stayed where God had placed him. Well, obviously not, because he's a man, and we men sometimes don't think straight. Yeah. So the problem is, just like us, why do we do the foolish things we do? Because we're stupid. I mean, God has already said, don't do this. Live this way and you're going to be blessed. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to be there with you. My presence is going to be there. You're going to have joy. You're going to live a victorious life. Just stop doing that. What do we do? Well, I want to. It's not that bad. I got over it last time. I'll get over it this time. Because we're stupid. And this is just Abraham's stupidity. Okay? Okay. Got that? So he had concocted this with Sarah a long time ago. And obviously, this isn't the first time we know from the Bible, but it's probably not really the second time either, is it? It's been a while. It's been through the, through the years. So verse 14, I'm almost done. Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him Sarah, his wife. Why did he do that? Did he do that because he was afraid of Abraham? He was afraid of God. And he acknowledged because God told him he was a prophet. And so therefore God showed Abimelech the, what Abraham's real need was. And Abimelech met Abraham's real need. Why did Abraham flee to the south? It is very possible. And so there are some really good uh, old Jewish rabbis that taught from the Old Testament this. And, and I think they're on to something. I don't know whether it's right or not. Uh, there's no way that I have to know. There's no way we have to know. But they taught this. As Abraham fled from the northern regions of the, of, of the promised land, where he was taken by God and shown the entire promised land, he is now out of the promised land. And he is headed in a direction he's not supposed to go, out of self-preservation, that he fled. And in his fleeing, he would have left behind the sheep and stuff, what people wanted because they wanted to kill him. Remember, the well-watered plains of Sodom and Gomorrah, they were well watered. There were lots of sheep. There were lots of animals. There was lots of wealth there. And then all of a sudden, the cities were destroyed, which was the financial centers. Not only that, the whole region was destroyed. The life was destroyed. All the cattle would have been destroyed, right? Their livelihood. But there are people living that relied on that. So what are they wanting? What are they going to take from Abram? His herds, his cattle, livestock. And so it was taught by the ancient rabbis that Abraham fled and he fled. When he fled, he only took the bare necessities with him and went south. And when he went south, he had no herds with him. And so out of the fear of the Lord, this is something that God would have worked in Abimelech's heart to give him, to give Abraham as an offering, a peace offering, since Abraham was a prophet of the Lord who destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah to not pray that God would destroy them, to give him a herd back and animals. And so this is restoration. It's a restoration by God. Abraham is in the wrong and God still provides. Let me tell you something, folks. You can be contrary to God sometimes in your life and God is still providing for you. He gives you air to breathe. He gives you food to eat and clothes on your back. Our God is good and great and mighty, even to His wayward children. Amen. God is good. Amen? No, now notice this. So to me, that's why they, they were restored. So what verse am I in? Verse 15. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleaseth thee. In other words, here's the context. Don't miss the context. Here's my land. I'm not going to touch you. Here's some animals, build your herd, restore your wealth. 
and then go from this place blessed. Because if Abraham goes from there blessed, there won't be a curse on Gerar. Makes sense, doesn't it? You got to remember, in the ancient world, even these people who worship the devil, even these people who worship demons, they knew there was a God. They just chose to worship a God of their choosing. Unlike today, where people say there is no God, the ancient world, nobody, you would, have run, you would not have run across what we would consider an atheist. As a matter of fact, you wouldn't have run across that until the age of enlightenment, really. Maybe the 14, 1500s in, in Europe, 1300s possibly. Before that, people, even though they worshipped other gods, they acknowledged that there is the Lord God. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? Let's keep going. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. That's important. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes, and unto all that are with thee and with all other, thus she was reproved, corrected. Why? Listen to this. And I want you to get this. What's the one thing you can take away from a woman that will destroy her? No. They're ready to get rid of them half the time. Security. You take a woman's security, you have destroyed the woman. Men don't need security. They need respect. You take away a respect of a man, you have destroyed the man. You take away a woman's security, you have destroyed the woman. And so in this sin, they were both in it together. Abraham wanted to save his neck. Sarah wanted to preserve her security. Don't miss this. If I go and live with him, you won't die and I'll have money. I'll have life. I'll have a roof over my head. I will have security. Come on. And so when he goes, hey... Here's a thousand pieces of silver. Here's Abimelech, the king of Gerar, a wealthy land, could have given her a hundred million pieces of silver. It's like somebody saying, write me a check for what I'm worth. One dollar. But a thousand pieces of silver, here's your security, woman. And it reproved her. It was a rebuke to her. God is all we need. Does everybody get that? Isn't that the coolest thing? This man knew exactly what needed to be done. He has a lost man. And he confronted Abraham and he confronted Sarah. He confronted Abraham because of his fear. He confronted Sarah because of her lack of security, lack of trust. You weren't trusting in your husband. You weren't trusting in your God. You were trusted in my wealth. So here's a thousand pieces of silver. Take it and be gone. That's a slam. Everybody still with me? Y'all are awful quiet. Either you're learning something or you're, you're thinking or you're plotting my death, something. It's very cool. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children. So Abimelech was obviously stricken with impotence, so he couldn't have any sexual relations with women. That's what was inferred above. And so God then healed him of that so he could have children of his own. And so while Abraham is dwelling in his land, the, the animals are, are replenishing and while the animals are replenishing, God is blessing Abimelech because of Abraham. And in Abimelech's house, even though he did not worship the Lord, he remained an evil man. God blessed him for Abraham's sake. And please don't ever miss this, folks. God will take the things of that world out there and bless you with it. This world is all going to burn up. This world is evil. The people of the world are evil. But God will take the people of the world and use them to be a blessing to you, to be a comfort to you, a rebuke to you, but also to be sustenance to you. 
How many of y'all work for people that are lost? I don't. I work for Jesus. Yeah, you work for lost people. Guess what? God is using a lost man to provide for you. Don't ever forget that. And finally, the last verse, for the Lord has fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abram's wife. And so God brought healing to him. Next week, chapter 21. Anybody got any questions, cares, comments, concerns before we roll? Did you learn anything today? That's the important stuff. Yeah, oh, Abraham had fear. Every man does. Any man ever tells you that he has no fears, he's lying to you. Yeah, every man has a fear. It's either a fear of something, someone, or rejection. But every man has a fear. Spiders. Yeah. Even great big huge men have fear of little itty bitty spiders. I've seen the girlish behavior on display personally. <laughs> All right, let's pray and we'll go home. Thank you so much for being in Sunday school this morning and I'll see you tonight. We'll do the rest of the, the message, the part two of the message tonight, okay? And uh, anybody want to pray us out? All right, bud. all that wisdom to bring to us, and Lord, just for, for all you do for us, Lord, how you provide even through lost people, and, and the, the darkness of this world, you still provide for your children, and Lord, we praise you for that, Lord, I do ask, as we go through the rest of our day, and Lord, that uh, you have your will and way, and Lord, I do again lift up all those who are struggling with, with sickness and health issues, Father, just have your, have your hand upon them, and give grace and mercy, Lord, we praise you, thank you for all you do for us, in Jesus' name, amen.